So, so Mazen, thank you so much for joining me here. Uh, Mazen and I met in a NARM training in outside Chicago, and uh, I think immediately we really hit it off, and we've had some great discussions. And so we wanted to get together from a very unique perspective of us being part of cultures that have long been uh, in conflict and are currently still in conflict. And I, I think about it from this kind of neurobiological perspective of understanding the amygdala and how you know we think about the amygdala of, of being like when we're faced with something that looks different or that that feels scary or threatening to us, we have this immediate neurobiological reaction that sends us into defense often. Mm -hmm. And I've always been curious about how we can shift that where when we see something that's new or different, instead of going into the place where we get into our defenses and then have those reactions, how do we actually shift it towards curiosity and, and openness? And so, um, you know, I asked Mazen if he'd be interested in doing this with me because I'm curious. I'm curious about from uh, your Muslim background and, uh, you know, Mazen has a very strong faith and uh, how is he integrating, how are you integrating uh, mm -hmm. this understanding of complex trauma and specifically the NARM approach and how can we start brainstorming together how we can help our cultures uh, to find, you know, greater healing, greater peace? And how can we, how can we start talking to the world about this? So that's kind of what I just wanted to start with. And just so curious to, to hear where you're at with all this. Great. Thanks, Brad. It's really good to be with you. And thanks for organizing this. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really great question. I think, you know, from our time together, at the last module where we kind of had a breakout group toward the end and kind of just debriefed from the whole training. I had mentioned about the Muslim community and my wanting to work with them and that being a part of that community and kind of having an inside look as to the problems and the strengths and all the different dynamics within it. I was looking as to how I can bring my training, whether from my professional training or my NARM training, mm -hmm. to really be able to grapple with these issues and then build bridges because mm. the greatest thing that we need now um, in the time of division and separations and compartmentalization of groups and tribes and nations you know the muslims have been always taught to harmonize and mm. to unify and so i think starting off by really being able to identify you know the humanity first and foremost of all the different people mm. you know in in america we have different nations. We have different communities from all over the world that have been amalgamated. Mm -hmm. It's a melting pot, but I don't really like that term either because it's kind of homogenizing mm -hmm. the different beauties and the different strengths of these different communities. But in terms of the salad bowl, if you will, of America, being able to identify the humanity essentially needs to be, I think, the first and foremost um, Pro, you know, part of the process by which we begin to build these bridges mm -hmm. and using, you know, things like neuroception, like you had mentioned, and training people to identify what's happening within myself that's getting triggered from the environment that, you know, is raising my alarms, and making me think a certain way, making me act a certain way, maybe reflex and knee jerk react in a certain way. And so being able to really come to terms with that as well is really powerful. And NARM does that really well. And a lot of the other somatic therapies mm. also bring that to light, the body and the neurological aspect of, you know, trauma as well as um, threat recognition um, mm. and processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before we start recording here, you and I were talking about com uh, community. And yeah. th this is something that I'm, I'm really curious about, too. It's like, how do, we, um, how do we differentiate between cultural connection and identity? Like, for example, you know, our heritage, our, our culture, our religion, our family, those are so important to us. And they define who we are. They define what's important. They give us a, a navigation system for the world. Mm. How do we differentiate that from the identity that actually people have been killing each other for for thousands of years like how, how do we how do we differentiate that i mean I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that but yeah so in the muslim community specifically here in america we find that there's a lot of times some kind of divisions in the way that different people identify some people identify themselves as americans point blank 
you know. And we'll find that many of the converts to Islam or the African-American population of the Muslim community here in America, they're American. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything else. And so, you know, you have this type of um, identification, as well as the second, third generation Muslims of immigrant parents that came over, from overseas. They don't know. Maybe they visited, like, I would visit Syria in the summer. Back mm -hmm. when Syria was Syria. And, you know, we have a house there. We had family there. We'd go visit there. I went to, like, summer school there. went to the beach. I had great memories. So my Syrian, you know, ancestry and history is present with me and mm. it's alive with me and it's palpable um, but not everyone has that and there's different degrees of that type of identification with one's past mm. um, other people may be first generation refugees coming from said syria or from burma where you, where you had spent time with mm. or yemen or whatever afghanistan you know they come with a lot of stuff they come with the cultural norms that were indigenous to those lands. They come with the cultural, you know, practices, languages, the habits, um, as well as oftentimes a lot of trauma, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's kind of a muddled thing because identity becomes kind of um, really murky when you get trauma involved with identity. As we know, you know, we kind of tend to use identities as a way of coping. Yes. A way of um, um, bridging the pain and numbing the pain and, you know, surviving. Mm -hmm. And so when they come here, you have people that are coming with a type of Islam, which is what we call as American Muslims, a cultural Islam. So they mm -hmm. come with a certain type of dress and a certain type of languaging. And, you know, the Muslim born, the American born Muslims here or the indigenous Muslim communities here, like the African-American and the white Muslims, they don't really recognize and identify with those same practices. So what's been really an interesting conversation here in America is actually the separating of the religion from the culture. Mm. Because the culture can vary. You know, yes. the, the Muslim culture in Syria is different than the Muslim culture in Morocco. It's mm. different from the Muslim culture in China mm. or India or um, Bosnia. Mm -hmm. so forth. And so being able to separate the tradition and the religion and, you know, the vertical aspect of life mm -hmm. from the more variegated multicultural um, dress and norms that come from the natural way that human beings organize themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you brought up an interesting point, you know, because you and I are specializing in working with trauma and okay. about how I really thought that that was very interesting what you said about how the trauma gets kind of integrated into the identity, into the culture. Right. And I wonder, you know, from your perspective with, because you and I had a, had an interesting conversation about this where you were talking about some of the, the people that have, um, you know, given Muslims a bad name uh, by acting in very extreme ways. And I, I liked how you said it about how that they, well, I'll let you say it. I just, I, it really touched me the way that you kind of framed that. Mm -hmm. in terms of looking at it through the trauma lens. Yeah, right, exactly. And so, you know, trauma in general for me has been an amazing, not only tool, but perspective, mm -hmm. because I've been able to penetrate through, at least in my own mind, my own consciousness, um, the patterns of people and really identifying, you know, I don't claim to know anybody, but just by seeing them or by meeting with them briefly, but you really tend to see patterns in people. And this is, you know, part of the traditional holistic Islamic mm -hmm. medicine mm -hmm. so that people, you know, understood the patterns of things, the, the movement of the heavens and the earth and the four seasons and the rhythms of life. And there's patterns in each of these types of things. And one thing that you can see with traumatized people is the extremeness mm. of their tendencies in whatever they're doing, you know? So it's a type of mentality that becomes fixated in these people that have oftentimes been really abused. Mm. And, you know, these things can get carried away really quickly, as we know. I mean, it's a human capacity yes. yeah. for extremism. It's not necessarily a religious or a Muslim or a Middle Eastern. It's a human capacity for extreme fundamentalist excess. Mm -hmm. 
You know, our teachers taught us in the spiritual way that the ego, the, the nefs they call it, is always inclining towards the extremes. Mm. And that's why the balance is what's always sought. Mm-hmm. And good religion should call toward the straight and center way. But just to kind of understand the process of these in the extreme population, yeah. these people are disenfranchised, and then you can see the acting out, what we call acting out, yeah. in the way of protesting, you know, this harm and this, you know, threat in their environment. Just like any other mammal, they're perceiving threat. And so what happens is that they begin to act out, and if they don't get really traction, any traction with that acting out, there's identifications that become, to become online and they become, you know, really immersed in the world of the threat and the opposition to that threat and this constant perpetual war within because of this perceived war without. Mm. And so, you know, some people are able to kind of manage that and some people are just led to huge extremes where their humanity becomes disintegrated and they can do hei- heinous things. These people who claim to be fighting in the way of God have destroyed and transgressed all of those principles, mm-hmm. all of them. And they're attacking Muslims. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like this autoimmune disease. You know, I'm in, I'm in healthcare. It's like we're, there's so much inflammation. Yeah. There's so much internal discord. And there's no way of addressing the root causes of these things because no one speaks the language of trauma and can give this type of psychology a space and a healing, mm-hmm. you know, and actually maybe get to it early enough where, you know, things can be done before it gets this bad. Yeah. But so what happens is that, you know, it, the community falls in on itself, yeah. attacks itself. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you described both the acting in, but also the acting out. And this is something I'm really curious about just coming from the Jewish culture and watching what, what's happened in Israel is, you know, this victim perpetrator dynamic, which I think is, is, is in both our traditions, <laughs> is that there, there's fundamental acting in, but there's also this fundamental acting out and kind of reenacting the uh, circumstances that happened to them or to mm-hmm. us. And I think that that's another piece of this puzzle. I mean, it really mimics what we work with with childhood trauma that people both you know who are victims of abuse, for example, they both act in towards themselves in, in specific ways, but then also end up acting out often in very similar ways to that they were acted upon as children. Right. And from a culture, I mean, it seems like both of our cultural, uh, you know, communities are dealing with that. And I don't know if you've thought about that or have thoughts about that, but how do we deal with this, this victim perpetrator dynamic that just continues to, to really wreak havoc? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the question of the day. I mean, that's just, if we could answer that question, we can really begin to dissolve this tension, mm-hmm. you know, that's found in, for example, the... Israel-Palestine issue, mm-hmm. but any other issue that we find all over the world, like the Myanmar-Burma issue, which is huge, and you're familiar with. Yes. So I, I don't have the answer to that, mm-hmm. but I know personally from my own study, from my own practice, from my work, is that the individual work is of the utmost importance. Mm-hmm. The individual work, the shadow work, this healing work has to become in some way taught to the mainstream. Yeah. You have to be able to see things through this lens and speak the language of trauma and understand how it works. Mm-hmm. You know, knowledge is crucial in this regard and knowledge has always been the key to change. Mm-hmm. And so being able to now identify what's happening and how can we begin to you know, make amends and rectify the situation from the individual perspective and then moving into the community and how that naturally happens. We just had um, last weekend, my mentor, Hakim Archuleta, he came into Chicago and we were teaching um, a Muslim private school in the city, somatic principles. They're a K through two school and they sought uh, Hakim and myself to help them really begin to kind of innovate a new tack forward. Wow. Using thematic principles, trauma-informed educational, you know, principles, and we spent two days with them, and it was marvelous. And the teachers really, there was a what you call the kerplunk, you know, the landing <laughs> of these like really important things that they see, they identify as humans within ourselves. We know this. I mean, there's a resonance with this truth, mm-hmm. this great knowledge. 
individually, but then also what, how they see the kids and the dynamics. And there's so much, you know, they're still really vital, these kids. And they really act in really strong strong and really solid ways that you can identify the patterns when they age we age we tend to kind of blend a lot of the stuff and imagine that kind of tear it out but kids are really strong and vital and those and they're, they'll speak their truth and so you can identify the patterns and so they really benefited from this work and you know and we're hoping that more schools muslim and non-muslim schools can begin to incorporate this stuff and teach the kids early mm-hmm. because if we can get the kids early and allow them to understand you know, threat in the environment, scanning here, using the body, grounding, breathing. And, you know, I mean, these are huge, huge tools and resources for people. That's right. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that if we can begin to do this work of healing the adults and then educating the children, we can usher in a new generation of people that Mm -hmm. are not going to be conflicted in the same way not going to be overwhelmed with trauma and stress and these divisions and playing these, you know, political games. I mean, it's so important that we have to do that. So I don't know how to, you know, the victim perpetrator, you know, how to get them together. And, you know, but if, it, if to me, if it's going to happen, it has to happen within the realm of trauma healing. Yeah. You know, it has to, and it has to be a, a way that people can come into a room together and leave aside, cast aside their prejudices and their you know negative thinking of the other, and just meet the other. Yeah. And then be raw. Mm-hmm. It has to be a rawness. It has to be a space for that oneness, authenticity, mm-hmm. and truth to come mm-hmm. and be spoken and to be felt. Well, and and also oriented about what you said about around humanity. That that seeing each other's shared humanity yeah. and respecting our cultural and religious you know, backgrounds, but really orienting to the humanity aspect. I think that's mm-hmm. so vital here. Crucial. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, like in terms of like how we bring this back to psychology too, it's like people are, you know, might be watching this and, and, you know, we're going off in all these kind of more cultural directions. And you, you talked a little bit about bringing it into to adults through healing and children and then community, but just even the psychology of it, I, I, I just think about, um, you know, that these are so entrenched in us. And we talk, you know, in the NARM work about how every time we, we start to make a little bit of separation or individuation from uh, our loyalty, mm-hmm. our loyalty to the abuse and the attachment relationship that we were connected to, we have a reaction to it's like we we reconstrict so every moment of expansion there's followed by this kind of constriction mm-hmm. or shutting back down mm-hmm. and just wondering if you have thoughts about that about how do we work with this kind of underlying deep loyalty even to the things that are actually harmful and and mm-hmm. disruptive of, of being with each other's humanity right yeah so that natural ebb and flow is going to be found in everything mm-hmm. you know when someone learns something there's going to be a contraction how am I going to use this? How is it useful? How am I supposed to you know, implement this in my life and make it practical for me? Maybe I don't like it. Maybe it doesn't conform to my previous identifications. Using a top-down principled approach, you know, for example, with the Muslims, um, core principles of humanity, of compassion, of connection, of unity, of giving the rights of others needs to be you know, highlighted and underlined and emboldened. And put at the top. <laughs> I mean, this, this needs to be right there for everyone to see that these are the principles of the tradition that you purport to follow. Mm. But they have to be maintained. Otherwise, you have to leave. Yeah. We can't, we, I mean, we can't be at the same table. We, we, we'll pray for you. We'll love you. We'll wish the best for you. But you can't be here if you're going to be antagonizing the people, the guests, for example. You, know? like, you can't be antagonizing people it's their face. That's, there's no room for that in the healing space. Mm-hmm. And so the principles of good religion don't allow for that from the get-go. Mm-hmm. So meeting from the principles and then being able then to identify, you know, that there's going to be these ebbs and flows and that there are people going to contract and, you know, being able, again, using knowledge and using somatic principles and being able to help them reflect themselves on your connection and disconnection and notice how you know you went back to your old ways right as soon as you began to open up about something becoming curious about things like that 
and really becoming self-reflective, you know, mm. I mean, but all the true religious traditions have this idea of reflection, of spiritual accountability, of looking within and not judging, but really being able to organize, how am I thinking about this? I mean, this is a very powerful capacity. Not, not many people can do this, but it has to be trained because everyone can do it because everyone's human beings. Mm. Everyone has a soul and is conscious. And so we have to enable them to, you know, find their way, even if they have to wobble their way there. People mm. have to be given the space to heal. And it's not going to be a linear path. It's not going to be very easy. There's going to be perhaps some backlash. You know, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's never been done. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it. We're doing it here. Yeah. Sorry? We're, we're doing it. We're trying we're to do it now. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. You no, know, but it's, it's, it has to be just, it has to be contained in a way. And that, the only way to do that is by first principles, mm -hmm. metaphysical principles. But then within that, I mean, so much can happen. And there has to be a room for that. I mean, yeah. and without judgment and without, you know, attacking or without, you know, disenfranchising the person, stripping them from their agency. I mean, what's happening for them is still very real. Mm -hmm. And they have to be able to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. And others see the struggle within, you know, I mean, and allow them to, you know, do that and then offer support. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. It is huge. So the, the last question I'm just curious about is, you know, I know you can't speak for a whole, you know, huge population, but for, for you, your experience of being a Muslim American and mm -hmm. having, you know, uh, your lineage and, and heritage back from Syria, mm -hmm. what would you want a Jewish person, a Jewish community, or even an American community, now that you live in America, what, what would you want us to understand or know from your experience that we could that would be kind of a bridge for us to understand more instead of looking at Mazen through like, Oh, he's, you know, Muslim, he's different than us. What would be the bridge towards our humanity? That that's something that you'd like us to know that's mm -hmm. important to you. It's a great question. Yeah. To know that I feel just like you feel, I bleed just like you bleed. I laugh. I cry. I have moments of ecstasy and joy and happiness. I have moments where I'm down, not feeling well, and I'm trying to reach out for others. I have a family. I have the weird uncle that shows up. And I mean, we have the same types of things. I had my ambitions. I have my work. You know, I have my inner critic, all of these different things. I have, you know, my heartbreaks. Mm. You know, I mean, really, I mean, I'm just like you in that we have the same type of experience. Mm -hmm. And just like how you differ from your neighbor and your coworker, we, we, you and I differ, but we also share the same type of human experience and the range of all the different feelings and problems that I'm facing, you face, we all face. And that's why we can become really, uh, we can really meet each other mm -hmm. in a place, you know. There's a roomy uh, line um, beyond the realm of right and wrong, there's a field. Mm -hmm. I'll meet you there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the greater community should also be educating people yeah. in this regard, using trauma mm -hmm. therapy and somatic therapy and the language in, they're in to be able to organize these things for people and say why it's not fitting within your own world too. The way you've organized the world is not right. And, you know, being able to people become have people become more self self reflective? Excuse me. Yeah. Well, and then and then I think that leads us full circle because then that supports these moments of connection, which allow us then to kind of calm down our nervous systems and to really just be present with each other, where we can share in humanity and 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 have meals together and pleasure and enjoy our families and and just be human together. That's right. Yeah. Well, Mazen, thank you so much. This is, I mean, it's always special to kind of have these conversations with you. I'm glad we can put this together and maybe share it from two people that are passionate about working with complex trauma. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I, I'm sure there'll be more to come. I hope so. Thanks very much, Brad, for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay.